So welcome everyone. This is another episode of the Epic Photography Podcast. Uh, today I'm joined by my co-host, another Team Epic member, my good friend Eric Kuna. You might know him by the Rocket Man if you are one of the the grid watchers, uh, because that's I guess kind of your nickname. Like I'm the cheeky Nando, so I guess you are the Rocket Man. And there's a reason for that. If you haven't seen Eric's photos on well, I think it's anything sky related, right? So they're just awesome. So yeah, you've been doing yeah. a, an awesome job with that. It's incredible the photos that you you can create. Unbelievable. Well, um, before we move on, uh, as usual, the Epic Photography Podcast is sponsored by our good friends at Platypod, the most compact, world's most compact tripod base. And uh, I use the Platypod. I know that you use them too, right, Eric? Oh yeah, I love the Platypod. In fact, uh love the new uh the new Platypod, the extreme, oh, the extreme. one to get because it's uh so such so much a time saver, right? Uh, because having those legs to be able to deploy quickly because the style of photography that I do, a lot of times I'm having to attach uh stuff to the ground like with the rocket stuff um or landscape or night photography wanting a very stable surface and something to grip. And having those legs to just pop out quickly, it sounds silly, but to put the legs on my own platypod, it was a minute or two. Um, now it's a second or two. And time yeah. is the biggest commodity we have. I mean, it's a thing that you can't get back. You know, it's always it's always leaving. It's all, You're always losing time. So anything that you have to get back time really is a, a great saver which kind of leads into the topic we're talking about today with plugins yeah. is yeah, that's, that's the right. thing with plugins is a lot of times their thing is they're a time saver yeah let me just go back to those spikes because sometimes I, I i get lazy and it's like oh i need to go and take a few well it's not yeah. much but it's like oh no I'll, I'll just fix that there's a little rock in here that i i put below the platypod and I don't need to deploy the spikes. I mean, I'm referring to the older models. Yeah, yeah. And then you're doing a long exposure and then because you are not properly stable, then it gets mass. So now with the new extreme model, it, it's just like, blink. So I'm still waiting for mine, but uh, <laughs> oh, I know that you've been using it. So that's, that's a yes, good thing. Yes, yes. Yeah, so let's let's go to the main topic for today, which is plugins and there's this thing and you and scott were mentioning that on the grid like you're not a photographer well you're just trashing that like you're not a photographer if you don't shoot in manual mode so you're not a photographer yep. if yep. you use uh, photoshop or and probably you're not a photographer if, if you use plugins right so that's what people think so what's your take on that well, I think that's where, you know, like you touched on, there is a, there's misconceptions out there. And that's what we were talking about is uh, professional, professional photographers, you know, people or who are sometimes giving you advice will give you advice that is based on old misconceptions or just outdated information, you know, and that's the thing with like the manual mode is really at the end of the day, there's a use for manual mode, but in modern photography, there's really that use is very small, you know, so you have to always kind of give an, uh, like adapt with the environment. And what's happening now with plugins is plugins are actually making it easier to do things that would have taken a long time in Photoshop or a long time in Lightroom that we could do very quickly. Or they're doing things like recovering stuff that we, we missed because that way we can we can kind of give more life to an older camera or something like that, which we'll get into. So yep. there's totally, there's a bunch of different things we can do. But at the end of the day, this whole thing of, you know, you're not a real photographer if you don't, if you use Photoshop or all that stuff. Like all the classic photographers, they went into a dark room, all the great photographers, and they all did post-production on their work with chemicals. So yep. telling me this this bunk that you shouldn't use plugins or you shouldn't use photoshop like throughout history that's been the thing because at the end of the day like like the main thing that i do is photojournalism i have to be very true to the form in photojournalism but i still my job is to communicate a story 
Well, there's some times where post-production allows me to get the image back to what the mind's eye saw, right? That the camera is dumb. It can see certain things and it can do certain things and it can expose certain ways. But like we have to make the, we have to develop the photo. We have to make the photo, right? And that's where being able to do that is something that we should, we should do. We shouldn't just succumb to, you know, hey, you know, I shouldn't do that because I wouldn't be a real photographer. Yeah. Like, well, yeah, know, no, that's not true. Know, yeah, you know what? What I found uh, with kind all old, old long career photographers that I've met he, here in Portugal, sometimes they go, "It's oh no, you're not supposed to use Photoshop or Lightroom or plugins or because they've been doing it the old way." They are not comfortable, and sometimes I see them using Photoshop, and they're not comfortable with that. And they don't, don't free themselves, say, okay, I can't do it in Photoshop. I'll have someone to do it under my direction. And so many photographers do that, so they're good with their camera, and they'll handle post-processing to someone else. But some of them mm -hmm. say, no, you're not supposed to. Just It's not because it's not supposed to it's just because they can't do them they can't do it themselves oh, that's usually so, what the case is yeah, that's exactly. usually what so the case is the translation for yeah. people that say uh you should never use photoshop is usually i have no idea how to use photoshop yeah, exactly just that's like, what they're oh, no. saying they're just saying i just don't know how to do it yeah so i'm telling you that way but again n neither one's wrong if you don't want Absolutely. to if you want to use plugins go by all means it just means when people look at my photo and look at your photo and they're like, wow, how's his so sharp? How's yeah. his so uh, less noisy? How's yeah. it's because I'm using plugins and you're not. So, yeah. I mean, it's, it's all up to the, it's all up to yeah, the it's user like at those, the end of the day. Those it's photographers your choice. Say, oh no, I, I don't use flash. I just, I, I use natural light. Well, because you don't yeah. know how to control the light. And so that's why you use yeah, natural light. My, my, my favorite statement uh, you know, Scott and I talk about this a lot, is when people tell me straight out of camera, when they use the word like, oh, they'll say straight out of camera. You know, it's like like they're wearing it like as a badge of honor, like hey, it's straight out of camera. I look at straight out of camera as like, okay, so you didn't take any effort to do any post on your photo, so you didn't develop your photo. But then they'll tell me, oh, I shot JPEG. And I'm like, well, then it's not straight out of camera. Yeah. You took Someone your camera sensor you. data... You took your camera sensor data and had them apply a bunch of effects on top of it. That's what a JPEG does. It applies a bunch of effects on top of it. Yep. It's doing all the processing for you. It's developing it right there. But the only difference with the JPEG is it's developed. If you go and edit it later, you've already had your camera lock in the development of it. Yep. Where if you shoot in RAW, you're still allowed to do what we did in the dark room back in the days, the things Ansel Adams did in the dark room, you could do to the photo because he took the negative, he took the raw thing and developed it into something. Well, exactly. that's why, what's the wrong thing with plugins? I mean, it's the same thing. You're just developing the photos and a lot of these plugins now work at the raw level. And I think that's another thing that I think a lot of people don't understand is a lot of these plugins back in the day, it used to be that they didn't really work at that raw level. And now they're all starting to develop and work at that raw level. Yeah, well, there's there's amazing plugins coming out all the time. And yeah. I remember first ones would be mostly like giving you some color effects or some light leaks or some borders and things that were mostly just like a stamp that all images would look similar because they were mostly not real like plugins like we have today but it was like just a stamping machine so just put that and eventually some some photographers that we know don't like them because it's it's like just going on instagram and applying a filter so uh, there's also that conception that plugins may be just like putting a stamp everyone will will look the same and so i don't go that route because I want to be different from the others, so I cannot use a plugin just because, like my sky will be exactly like your yeah, sky. Yeah, uh, you make sky you make a good point. Yeah, yeah, because I mean you make a good point because 
Um, you know, that's the one thing, uh, with, with great power comes great responsibility. Right. Yep. And that's where at the end of the day, like if you're just taking the defaults, like it's like anything. Well, I mean, again, you hit JPEG and you're, you've got your camera settings, you're hitting that default of that. Well, your, your photos are all going to be processed the same. If you go into any one of these plugins that are in that creative vein, you know, and just use the preset and don't adjust anything else, then you can get into that trouble. It's kind of like that with sky replacements. The worst thing you do with sky replacements is use the sky replacements built into the software. Why? Because then it's a clear tell. Everybody starts by using those and you can call them out and you can be like, oh, that's Adobe sky replacement. Oh, that's Skyloom sky replacement. Oh, that's, you know what I mean? You can just go down mm -hmm. the list. So. Yeah. We as we do have to take a little extra effort to make it unique to us, but again, the time it saves, you might as well go through that extra effort. And then, but that's that's a key thing that um, you know we get into this that what you're talking about there, I think, is a problem. But that's in that cre there's to me three buckets that I put plugins in. Yeah, I was the going one to you're ask talking about, about when you mentioned yeah. creative. Okay, you are making different segments for those plugins so uh, i guess yeah. you classify them in different ways yeah so for me uh you know i have a, yeah i have a laundry list of plugins that i use but um at the end of the day they kind of get broken down into three categories for me one is utility plugins they are doing a task they are utility they're like um they, I put those in the same vein as I have a certain uh, thing in my camera that I want to do. Like, I'm doing long exposure noise reduction in camera. Well, I can also do noise reduction in post. You know, so these are utility plugins. They're going to do a job, and they're designed to do one job very well. And they're not designed to do anything really to my photo. They're just designed to do something like remove noise, increase sharpness, like a, up a res the image task, basically yeah a technical task and those plugins are the ones that i use probably the most because there's usually something wrong that i need to recover because of a limitation with the photography so for example i use this all the time i do a lot of astro and milky way photography well that's where i do need a lot of times to remove noise well, there's different techniques to remove noise. I could go out in the field and I could shoot hundreds of images and I could I could I could composite them on top of each other and then astrophotographers say, "Well, you're not real if you don't remove the noise that way." But I'm like, "But you're doing post and compositing. I'm using a plugin that's analyzing the raw data and then removing the noise. Like it's pretty much the same thing. Like it's 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 just two different ways of doing it. But yeah. some people get to like, so you've got those type of plugins where you're and just removing noise. Those, I don't know how do you use that. So you're not a photographer because you're using something that yep. I don't know how you do that. I know. And what's so what's so weird about it nowadays, again, um, you know, there's a couple of them like I could talk about, like on one, no noise. There's DXO Pure Raw, which has a, a raw processor uh, that does uh, noise reduction. And then there's Topaz Denoise. I use all three of those. I use all three of those in three different ways, though, to remove noise. Certain ones work on certain images, and certain ones work better on others. However, all three of them are great. Like, if you, if you had one and you had another, I wouldn't tell you, go buy this one over this one. I mean, I have ones that I prefer more generic. Like, I think that... You know, there's certain ones that will work on, on more types of images, but not so drastic. But the point being, that removes noise in your photo. That's what those three plugins do. And they do it at the raw level. But that's all they do. They're removing noise, and they're doing a couple other things in that, in that processing, like removing noise, removing uh, uh, vignetting, stuff that you would typically have that is a problem from things that we did. For example, I shoot the Milky Way photography. I have to shoot at a very high ISO. So naturally, my photos are going to be noisy. Another thing is in my rocket photography, I'm shooting stuff that's out in the atmosphere. I'll do these uh, shots where it's like a nebula. It looks like a nebula of the rocket, like up in the upper mm -hmm. atmosphere. Well, those a lot of times to capture that data, 
I'm shooting at 25,000 ISO, 51,000 ISO. These plugins, I can Hold go on. in there. You're, you're not a photographer you, if you shoot at 51,000 yeah. ISO. <laughs> well, I can tell you this, that image, one of my images at 51,000 ISO has, has been my best, it is my best selling image yeah. of my career, oh, you paid for say tons that. of gear, <laughs> paid a tons of gear, and nobody has ever sent back the photo and said, oh, oh. This isn't a good photo because you saw that at 51,000 ISO. They say, wow, I can't believe you captured all that color and that detail of a rocket 100 miles up in the atmosphere, like, you know, basically yeah. illuminating itself, you know, as, as stuff's coming back to land. And it just, it's impressive. Yeah. But then I did use noise reduction on those photos and it removed most of the noise and when you print it out, you can't really tell. And you used a plugin, right? So. Yeah, I did. I <laughs> did. Course. I have to. Yeah, yeah, because, but in order to do that specific task, in order to capture the amount of light I needed, I need to boost up my sensor to be so sensitive because a rocket's moving, the stars are moving, to freeze everything in that frame. I'm. That's really what I am, is I love being an action photographer. And you would think... Oh, Milky Way, that's not action. Actually, Milky Way is probably the biggest action photography thing you do. The universe is moving at hundreds of thousands of miles, <laughs> miles an hour. We're rotating at thousands of miles an hour. And you're trying to capture these stars in like 15, 20 seconds. It is like high action photography. And that's what I love. I love mo peak moments of action and all that. Well, I need these tools sometimes to add back in what it took to capture that image. Yep. And that's like noise reduction, you know? So that's, so, that's why I love those utility other, plugins. Let's go back to the other two, two. Um, uh, cat categories that you're mentioning that you, you put our Well, so then you, you talked about one, you know? So there's the utility plugins we talked about. Then there's these plugins that fit into what I call the creative plugins. They are the plugins like you're talking about, where it's usually you're hitting a button to do a look you're doing some kind of treatment to them. You're doing something that is that is giving it a creative look or you're adding an element to it in post, like a lens flare. You're doing something creative with it. So there's those. You know, a big one that I use in that category right now is uh, Boris FX Optics. Yeah. I use that a lot Boris for that is, because it's, it's one of these cool. plugins that allows you to do stuff in, in, in post in their application very quickly that I could totally do in Photoshop. I could do all this stuff in Photoshop. The difference is it would take me, you know, an hour. That's I talked to like one of my friends, like Brett Malley was talking to me about it, uh, Kelly Wynn instructor, mm -hmm. and saying, you know, like at the end of the day, like the thing with Boris that's interesting is, I, again, I, he's like, and he's way better than me at the Photoshop stuff. He's like, I could do it. I'd take a lot of time to do it in Photoshop or a little time to do it in Boris FX. He's like, does that make me, I, I don't think that makes him a worse artist because he's deciding, I just want to take less time. His results are the same. If not, a lot of times way better than what if you did it in Photoshop. Yeah, and with, So and there's with, that. Is there yeah. a utility? Creative. Yeah, and with, with Photoshop, when if you go, let's say I'm, I'm comfortable with Photoshop, but I'm not a Photoshop wizard. So there's stuff that Boris Effects does that I... I could take months to be in tons of Calvi One classes before I could actually master all those skills. But with that, I can actually create something really fast. And not just that, let's say that you're adding some flames and things, and you say, okay, I'll go on Adobe Stock and I'll get some flames and I'll use some blend modes and I'll create a composite with that. But then I need to change that and suddenly I'm back to square one. While with Boris effects, I'll just go and tweak the parameters or I'll just drag the splines and things and it's done. So it's, it's so, so different. Yeah, that's, what's, that's what is different about their plugin versus some of the other ones, you know. And, and I, I like some of the other ones. Like I use uh, Luminar a lot, like their, their new Luminar Neo. It has some good looks in it. 
on one effects is another one that I like. I like certain effects that those plugins have. I used uh, for years. I love the Nick collection. You know, that was something that came from Nick and then Google and then now DxO. Mm -hmm. And these plugins are all in this creative vein for me. Those are the plugins that, you know, they're doing a look or they're doing a treatment. They're doing an effect on the photo that is a creative style. It's not utility. Now, some of these plugins do have utility features in them. You know, like they'll still have utility features, but they're kind of not focused on the utility. They're focused on having a bunch of different effects and a bunch of different filters that are going to apply looks. But that's what, to, to your point, Boris FX Optics is great because it allows you to get in there and really customize that effect to be unique to yourself. And I think that's one of the things that sometimes trips up people when they're using creative plugins is if they're not flexible enough, to your point, they start looking like the same image as other people are doing because it's the same effect that's applied. So yeah, unless, just, and that's a one thing same. when you're getting into, yeah, you're getting into plugins, make sure that you are getting in there and playing around and adjusting that. So you're not just using the canned one, you're kind of adjusting it a little bit or making the continuity look like more of your image, you know, making things like, like one thing in optics that I use a lot is whenever I'm putting in effects, making sure I'm tinting it or making it look like the environment that it's going in, like influencing it by the picture not just stamping it on the you know yeah. the photo yeah exactly and uh, there's um there's these things about uh boris effects and we we're talking about boris because well it's it's awesome and you've been using the, this new version and i've been using it and it's really awesome and one thing that i can see that is that well we as photographers have huge libraries and we can use our own libraries if you're doing, we all need to prepare a document or a presentation or a conference or something. And we need stock photos. And sometimes it's interesting to add something that is not there, let's say, like your, well, some fire or some background, some texture, and you can create all that. And not just as a photographer, but also as a graphics designer. And suddenly, if you're just a photographer, you don't have the skills to do all the graphics design thing, now you can, because you have all these effects that are really easy to do. And just with um, a plugin. So, yeah. And there's yeah, a third. I mean, yeah, yeah, well, there's saying? a third one. Yeah. There's a third one. You know, we got start getting, you know, we got utility plugins, they do one job. Creative plugins, they do a bunch of different things. They're going to influence your image, but you have to get in there, and there's a bunch of different looks. And then there's a third plugin category, and this is one that I don't I don't use, and that is alternative plugins. These are plugins that really they're trying to get you to, to process with those plugins, be it like a DxO Photo Lab on one photo raw. They're basically saying, hey, I am going to be a raw alternative. I'm going to be a, a Lightroom alternative, a Photoshop alternative, for, or a camera raw alternative for processing your photos. Those are the type of plugins that I don't use. I, I, camera raw and Lightroom, that's, that's my starting point. And then it tends to be from there, what do I want to do with it? Now, for noise reduction, I actually do that before. I do an, I do that processing. Like I'm going to remove that noise at the raw level and then start processing because I know the noise is already going to be a problem. You know, I've shot at 6400 ISO. I want to remove this noise. And then I the reason I'm doing that at that stage is it's a garbage in, garbage out thing. That if you start processing your photo with a bunch of noise in it and don't use that noise reduction again at the raw level, you're processing all that noise and amplifying that noise rather than removing that noise and then increasing the signal. Cause that's what we want to do. We want to remove the noise at first, increase the signal. And then, you know, really honestly with the utilities, I usually use the denoise. And then at the end we're doing the other utilities. And that is at the end, it's like, do I need to sharpen the photo more? Do I need to up res the photo? You know, do I need to change something about it? You know, it, but that's where if you get into those uh, different categories, that alternatives is one that I, I, I always like to, because I think people think of those products as 
plugins or standalone applications so they kind of lump them in you can't really lump them into plugins that there are these alternatives out there which are fine you know i don't there's not a problem with them i've tried using them i just when i try using them i'm like you know what they're not get, they're not saving me time so i don't use them you know and that's just me i mean i have no problem though if somebody wants to do an alternative the the one thing that alternatives really help is Sometimes people don't want to use Photoshop in Lightroom. You know, I, I can get that. But at the end of the day, that's it's better time. It's better efficiency. I, I know Camera Raw so well. I know Lightroom so well that I just, I don't have a need to gain, gain back time by going to an alternative. Yeah, I, I confess that I also don't go with the alternatives because in the end, if you're into the Adobe ecosystem, really it doesn't make much sense to go and have an alternative processor to Lightroom. It's like, oh, I don't need that. It's, it just makes my whole life a lot more complex if I have to handle that. So I prefer to don't use those, even though sometimes the package that you're buying does have something that you might want to use as a plugin, but as a, like a raw processor, uh, I'm with you. I, 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 I stick with Lightroom and Photoshop and uh, and then some plugins to, to go with that. And I think it makes my life easier that way. There's, of course, there certain people that, again, don't use Lightroom. They just prefer to use Photoshop because that's the way they handle their photography for years. They might use Adobe Bridge and they're comfortable with that. And so... They prefer to use something else, and that's fine. Sometimes it's just those people that say, hey, I don't want to pay a subscription. Even though their mobile is on mm -hmm. a subscription, their TV services, yep. their music, everything is on a subscription, but no, I can't pay Adobe a subscription, So, or that I don't want to pay a subscription, and then I go with... And I get that. Thing. I yeah. get that. Like, like, And that's what I'm saying. Like, That's fine if that works for you, yeah, but... Right. I will say that, uh, you know, for me, it would take more time. So it'd be almost like, I, I again, I go back to, you know, one thing that I'm very big on is using my barometer of time as a commodity, you know, that I have to look at time as a commodity. Like this is something that costs something like, and it costs them again, the most valuable thing, right? Yep. We cannot get this back. There is nope. you're not making more time. And you get to there's no age, way it, to make it, it more time. It becomes even more valuable. So <laughs> yes, so that's when you get down to it. These yeah. it's it's time saving these these things because again, even the time saving I found with my astrophotography, I was spending so much time trying to deal with noise that having the freedom to not really have to focus on spending so much time dealing with noise, it allows me to be more creative. Yeah. And that well, that then makes my work better. So it's all, it's just, it's it, and then it gives me more time to do more things. And it's just, that's what well, it's yeah. really plugins for me come down to those well, utility plugins are time savers. The creative plugins are differentiators. I'm thinking that the, the shot that you're mentioning, the rocket that was shot at 51,000 ISO or something, there's no way you can capture that like in a sequence doing like 15 second shots over and over and over to... The rock's moving. Yeah, the rocket's moving. Like so like it's moving so fast. I, I, I have over years figured out the... Ex like there's a panning speed I can go at to get the stars and the rocket. And I mean, it's minute, but it's exact and it's a certain shutter speed you know, like, you know, I can get down to a fifth of a second. I can get to about a one twentieth second. I'm going to be camping somewhere in there. And you can't, how can you, you can't capture that light in a, in a tenth of a second you without boosting that ISO so much. Yep. So you have to do that in order, like either that or you succumb to, I'm not going to get the shot at all. So it's like, I'm either, mm -hmm. I'm not going to get the shot. Well, again, that technique won me last year like the i got the first place in the space category in aviation week right you know so they're big contests like first place that shot that i won for was twenty five thousand six hundred iso right and that's but that's what it needed for that image to create that image like if i wouldn't have gone to that point 
I wouldn't have had an entry for the contest and I wouldn't have won the contest because I wouldn't even be able to. And that's, that happens with a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. Cause people will send me their images, you know, and ask me, cause I, I've told people I've been an open book about all my settings and everything. I, I'm a teacher by trade. I like to help people. So, um, I, I have no problem telling people, but what ends up happening is they send me their image and go, how are you getting this? And then like, I've told you, I've told you, but I looked at your metadata. I, well, I look at their metadata and I'm like, you're shooting at 3,200 ISO. It's not going to work. You can't capture that amount of light in that short amount of time. Like it's not going to work. I know you're scared of the noise, but I, I, I am no longer scared of noise between our new sensors that are in some of these cameras because the new sensors are really i mean shooting at iso 400 right now on my my canon is like shooting at iso 100 on my old ones you know shooting at iso 6400 is like shooting at iso 1600 you know and and that's the truth is iso in back of the film days used to be a standard ISO now is not standard at all. Like people don't realize that. Like like ISO is arbitrary to the camera manufacturer. So what they call the ISO isn't really there isn't like a standard film ISO anymore. It's just a sensitivity on your camera and it's boosting it and lowering it. I mean you can think of ISO as kind of like sensitivity. You're just boosting and lowering it. And don't look at the number anymore. Yep. Because, and I think that's another thing that misconception that comes from old, older days and then film people that were experts in the film days, then come over to the digital days and then start spewing this. Oh, cause they're looking at like, if I loaded in ISO 1600 film, it was unusable. Like nobody did it. Like, it, but that's because it was just, that was at that time we're in 2022, like, like shooting at 1600, 1600 ISO like you have to really zoom in to see the noise on these new cameras. Like the, like a can is a shoot with like, it's, you really got to get in there to see noise, yep. but we're all scared of it. And then if you do see any noise, Holy moly, you put these plugins on it and it just like, it's like just you, you see the before and after and you're like, it's just wiping it out. And you're like, what is this black magic they're doing? <laughs> I don't get it. Yeah, that's right. That's right. There's the, Right now, the the post processing that some plugins allow us to do it's it's really incredible. So let's talk. Well, with so so Fernando, like, what what plugins uh, do you use? Like, yeah. do you do you have certain plugins that you use on I a regular have, basis? I use most of the things I do on my photography. I can do without going to a plugin. Yeah. Because yeah, we all can. Yeah. 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 Most of the things I, I do, it's not that I don't need a plugin, but I do have a set of plugins that I keep up, update, up to date and I upgrade whenever there's a, a new version. And one of them I use since the time that it was very expensive. And I'm talking about the Nick collection. Now at the XO product, it was free at some point from when Google bought them. Um, well, I remember my first license from from Nick software was very expensive and at the time yeah. they had they had denoise they had sharpening and things that you you would use and then there's my favorite there it's it is silver effects that's that's the main reason and i don't do much black and white photography but when i do i like to go into silver effects and give it a try and try to be creative with that so that's that's when i use mostly for silver effects which is my favorite for for black and white i i do have topaz labs the the denoise ai and i think it's um i think yeah that's denoise ai because yep, to, yep. the names are so similar like everyone has yeah, AI denoise right ai now, so, is topaz yeah, yeah denoise yeah. and and sharpen ai so those are two that I use. Um, I'm well, just like you are saying, we need to be careful when we are using plugins because if you're taking the sliders way too much, then you're not adding mm -hmm. up to the, the the photo. You're actually destroying that, and so I usually try to be careful with that. 
just because even being awesome, those plugins, sometimes if you're using them too much, then suddenly, and I've seen photos processed with Sharpen AI that I say, well, that was Sharpen AI, wasn't it? Yeah, well, you took it too far away because right now there's that's like a mess. But um, well, it's not the problem with the plugin itself. It's just because... It's a lot of the times the use case with it. I mean, like, for exactly. example, like, that's that's one that I use a lot, Sharpen AI, uh, Topaz Sharpen AI. Mm -hmm. I still think, like, Topaz, like, has the lock on the sharpening thing. I don't know what they're, like, and, and again, when we're recording this, that's the stage it is now. That couldn't mean it couldn't change tomorrow because somebody comes yeah. out with something better. But I will say that, like, I've tried other sharpening and it always comes back to using Topaz Sharpen. Yeah. But with great power comes great responsibility. Absolutely. If the the worst thing I think people do with Sharpen AI, Fernando, is they don't use the new feature of masking, right? And it's been out for a little while inside of Sharpen AI. But having the ability to localize your sharpening to the subject and not sharpen because where sharpen falls apart. And where you're saying you can see is usually because somebody's doing a generalized sharpening and then sharpen AI is seeing clouds in the background and they're blurry and diffuse because you've got what's called depth of field, right? Because you shot the foreground subject and there's something behind it. Well, if you just let sharpen AI like go crazy, it's going to look at those clouds and say, well, I want to sharpen the clouds. Let's try to sharpen the clouds. Ooh. And then you'll have these artifacts and you'll yeah. have these streaks and it'll kind of look like somebody yeah. painted the sky, right? Yeah, those are usually And it's like, that's, that's, that's like not the sharpen AI thing. that, yeah. yeah. That is not sharpen AI. That is, you didn't tell sharpen AI not to sharpen the clouds. Yep. Now, back before they had mask or before they had the masking in sharpen AI, I used to sharpen the photo with sharpen AI and then go in and mask in the sharpening in Photoshop because that's the way it was. You wanted to localize the sharpening to what you wanted to sharpen, you know. And I think that's one of the things that people get wrong is they do these generalized sharpenings to the whole photo and then you get these artifactings but again that's a like you said that's a use problem that's yeah, a user exactly. problem yeah. not a software problem yeah. now the software is getting better and better at at not sharpening things that we're telling it to sharpen that we shouldn't tell it to sharpen I mean, it's so good now. I mean, you really can hit like the auto button inside of Topaz Sharpen to select the sh sharpening and it will select your subject. It's like select subject in Photoshop. It's really good about saying, oh, there's the bird. Boom. I just want to sharpen the bird because that's what you want to have sharp. You know, you don't want to sharpen the whole photo. <laughs> like depth is good. Having stuff blurry yeah, is we, good. We, we pay a lot of money for lens. That yes, we pay a lot of a money for blur. shallow depth of field. Yeah. And then we sharpen where we're yeah. not supposed to. Yeah, we like we just blast the whole image. And it's like, don't blast the whole image. Like, yeah. I want that one thing in, in focus. I, I want to draw your eye to the eagle flying. Yeah. Not to the clouds in the background. Not to the branch he just left. Like, that's 20 feet behind him. Like, I want the eagle to be sharp i don't and and that's where you get into it like really wanting to localize that sharpening but it goes that way for all this stuff yeah again yeah. you have to be very careful yeah. how you use it you can't just go to a go you know all the way to 11 you gotta like kind of back it down a little bit yeah. well there's another one that that i i have to confess that what was it like last year or maybe a year and a half uh i i had Boris effects and I was like, oh, okay. The, you know, like the, the, um, I call that the, the, the bolt, like thunder and lightning, you know, the, yeah, the, the renderings, the, yeah, yeah. The, the lightning bolts. Yeah. Oh, that was cool. But then it's like, oh, and I guess yeah, I, I could use just, that once. I could use that twice in my yeah. life. Maybe and I was like, well, I don't know. It, this is cool, but I, I got lost into the huge realm that it's Boris effects. And it's like, then I went back just to, okay, I, I guess I don't need that. But just like with Photoshop, if you open it the first time, it's scary. It's scary. Like, oh, there's too many tools in here. There's, what's blend modes? What? Well, suddenly it's yeah, like, like, whoa, whoa, danger, yeah. danger, run yeah. away. 
I'm running away. I'll go to what I used to do, and I'm not spending time with that. But if you actually spend the time and you start learning how you can use that and you, you don't use it as, as a stamp and you can actually start creating things. And actually, I was watching your, your Kelby One class that was just released by the time we are recording that. And you have some very creative ways that just... I was not even thinking about that. It was like subtracting and instead, well, you're actually you're adding something, but like you're subtracting, you're, you're like, um, removing light, you're, you're doing a lot of things that, again, we, we, we keep learning. And it's Boris effects right now is, is something that, and, and apart from what you can create with it, it's also fun. I can spend hours it is, just it is playing fun. with it. Yeah. But, you know, I think the thing with it, uh, like with the tool like that, you know, and, and, and again, Boris, I put in, it has utility stuff in it, but I put it in the creative vein. Yeah. I use that. And again, I said, I, I use on one effects and sky loom luminar a lot. Uh, those three. Um, but I really prefer Boris effects because it gives me so much um, customization and I can make it unique, but you can get lost in that. But a lot of times with me, when I'm looking at an image, when I'm doing something to it in post, my intent with it, I have two things. First, I try to look at the photo, and sometimes I shoot photos with the intent of doing stuff to it in post. Like, for example, I shot um, an astronaut in a costume where I had him holding a glowing moon, right? Yeah, I saw that one. But I knew I shot that with the intent of I'm going to replace the moon with a higher resolution moon because it's never going to be like, it was a 3D printed moon that kind of has edges, but it had a light inside because I wanted it to glow to give that natural glow so then I could accentuate that natural glow, right? So that's where sometimes I'm shooting stuff with the intent of doing stuff in post, the other way is I'm taking something that I wanted to capture, but I, I'm returning it to the mind's eye. What my eye and what the viewer's eye would have saw if they could have looked at through it uh, through human eyes. Because a lot of times we see a lot more to a scene with our eyes than our cameras can ever capture. You know, But we can actually start pushing that because the camera's if have a great dynamic range right now. I mean, you know, there's, there's no better time. I mean, the, the these sensors and these cameras are ridiculous. So we can start pushing that dynamic range to where it can actually go past the mind's eye and start getting into uh, almost surrealism, you know. And that's where I kind of hang out. I hang out right on that edge of photorealistic and surrealism. I almost want you to, like, be like, is that real? But yet it is real. It's not too far, but it's like, I don't get like why that's so vibrant or why that's so clear or, you know, and that's a big thing with my rocket images is that again, I'm just kind of pushing that line, but I'm never doing anything really totally fake. But if I am doing something fake, I'm letting you know about it, but I'm just kind of returning it to where the mind's eye go. One of the, one of the images that you know and people love it like people love the image right i i was i shot this f35 and it's one of the the demos in the class you know i shot this f35 and it was like it was this weird overcast hazy day but in the camera i i chose i want the jet to be sharp i want to cut through the haze i want to make sure that i capture all the vape and all the stuff coming off it but I'm going to sacrifice not getting as much of the environment where if I would have got the environment, I would have had a blurry jet or would have had a diffuse jet. It wouldn't have detail in it. Well, I'm just returning it to what I saw in my mind's eye. So I'm adding the fog back over the jet and I'm adding in the afterburner that was underexposed because I exposed the jet properly mm -hmm. and froze the jet. So I'm just returning it to what my mind's eye saw. So that's where it's kind of like a blurring of the line. It's but but it's also an image that you can't capture with just a camera because it just can't get the dynamic range that we yeah. can see. Yeah, there's more than one exposure there that you can yeah. get 
just with one. And, and you and you can't, especially in my style of photography, because again, I'm I, I'm a action photographer. Peep moments action. You can't. It's easy to take an HDR image when things aren't moving. Yeah. It's hard to take an HDR image when things are moving, especially at thousands, hundreds well, and, miles an hour. We're and, talking, and like if you have. A guy on a motorbike running on a, uh, like a racetrack, you can say, well, do it again, do it again. It's like, yeah, you just can't do, it again. do that with a, with a rocket. Oh, just come back and let's do the launch <laughs> yeah. again. Hey, atmosphere, can you just rewind the Milky yeah, Way a little, a little bit, bit? You know, <laughs> there's it no doesn't way. Work that way. <laughs> okay, well, we are running out of time. I just, I, I do have one more plug in. And uh, I'm, I'm going to say that it's not something that I use a lot, but I'm going to mention this because I actually, sometimes I use it just for the fun of it. But this is something that a lot of people um, enjoy, which is create like a, a painting out of a photograph. Mm -hmm. And yeah. sometimes I do that because either a friend is actually painting with, with paint and, and, and well, like, a painter and they want to have a look or I want to show them well that's how it could look like if you paint it so I use one one plugin from exposure software which is snap art uh, it's been mm -hmm. a while since they last updated it but it still works works good so that's one of those that I use then I also have one that I use for Photoshop well not one but a few of them which is from a company called Infinite Tools. They have some interesting tools, one that does textures, which is good. F um, but again, you... Well, and, on, and there's... And it's there's more a, like... There's a, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, there, there's, there's plugins again, like you're doing there, where they can be used to do something, but... You know that you you need to to make it painterly, right? Yeah. So it's like, could you do it in Photoshop, or could you use this plugin, even though they haven't updated it in in yeah. a while? Could you use this plugin to do it and get to the results quickly, yeah. right? Exactly. And you that's can do you that. Yeah, to you it. can do that in Photoshop. Of course, you can. Even Photoshop has that kind of filter for ages, but the results that you do with Photoshop are not that good. You can try to recreate that, but it's probably faster to actually paint them than do it. So the plugin works really well. So that's that's one thing I do. So anything else? Yeah, you want to um, add? yeah. I have a, a a couple a couple others. You know, real quickly. Um, one is again the, in the utilities that I use a lot when I'm making time lapses. So um, LR time lapse is one that I use inside a Lightroom a lot. This That's a plug-in for Lightroom that allows us to do time lapses. The big thing with that is it allows us to make, um, to take any flickering or any differences in luminance that changes or differences in the settings that change and allows us to quickly apply those, keyframe those, so we have a, a, a nice cohesive plug-in or a nice and cohesive time lapse, I should say. Um, so there's that one. And then there's one final one that we didn't really, I talked about in the beginning, but I think it's very important nowadays that, we, you know, like we talked about with the noise, the noise plugins really eliminate this fear of going to 12,800 ISO. Even with a eight-year-old camera, 10-year-old camera, you sh you can get way more life out of your out of your camera by using these plugins too. Because you're able to to kind of counteract my sensor being a little bit more noisy. Another thing that I think people ignore nowadays, and they look towards, oh, that new camera has 50 megapixels re resolution. Is there's applications out there? One that I love right now is On One Resize, their new Resize, which mm -hmm. they've been doing it forever. Nick's been doing it forever, and Topaz has been doing it forever is having these um, upscalers that are very good. Topaz Gigapixel is good as well. And that is these can give a little bit more life to your camera as well. Or it counteracts this argument that, oh, I need that 50 megapixel camera. You know, my main camera 
you know, is a, a Canon R6. It's, it's a whole 20 megapixels, right? Same as mine. Yep. But here's the thing. with with When I load that into On One Resize, I can take that to a 120 megapixel image and it actually looks better than the yep. 20 megapixel image, right? So that's the way I shoot anymore. And I think I've got to the point where I've the megapixels are gone because of this. The megapixel arguments in my in my head in me for me it's gone because if i have a client and this has happened to me before if i have i'm working on an assignment and i'm shooting with a certain camera and i just don't have the resolution for the end medium in which they're wanting it they say to me oh i need this resolution if i've got 12 megapixels i can get anywhere they want to go Right. If they want to go to again twelve, I could probably go. I could get up to near a hundred, and nobody's ever asking for a hundred. You know, they they might be asking for again to kind of go up to twenty or forty or you know somewhere up in there. Should be no problem. It'll be no problem. So my thing is like, why would I shoot and store all these big files and all this information and I say I got to have a 100 megapixel sensor or I've got to have an 80 megapixel sensor so I can have all this data at the end of the day like I know that it is there is the resolution there and yes it is better but how much better and how many images are you taking and saying if you're that person to you can afford all the storage. If you're getting those jobs where people are just like, yeah, you know, we need all this resolution and we need all this stuff. But most of us, again, and I'm, you know, I'm doing this stuff for clients, for assignments. And one of my images recently, a couple years ago for a big Mars mission we were doing, the image got all over the place that was shot with a camera that was 20 it was a digital camera 20 years old it was i used it for a specific purpose because its shutter speed goes a little higher mechanically and that resolution of that camera is 4.6 megapixels but that went on magazines newspaper tv no problem because the end resolution i worked on the image i just took it to 20 megapixels and 20 megapixels works for most people well, TV, but I just TV, did it through a little plugin. Yeah, and TV, TV is not even the TV. You don't need anything. Yeah, exactly. you don't need anything. There's this misconception. Yeah, and, and with, Instagram yeah. and all this. You don't need yeah. anything. It's yeah, really when it comes down to it's magazines anymore. Yeah. That's where I have to kind of like go up a little bit. But again, with these plugins, you yeah. don't have to worry about that anymore. There, yeah. I mean, that's where if I can go back to, uh, you know, it was a Canon One D released in like. It was like turn of the century, like 2000, you know, and it's like, if I can go back all the way to that, up res that, and it's totally fine with everybody, you know, I just don't know where yeah. this need for all this resolution when, comes in. Yeah. When do, when you have the image ready, when it's printed, no one will ask you what was the ISO, what was the yeah, camera. Yeah, and nobody's well, asking me that. I sell that. I sell that to you. Yeah, other photographers yeah. might ask because what... Like, what camera was that? Yeah. Because they're expecting that it's like a, a brand new supermodel, then you end up using something old. And I see that um, there's this misconception about uh, resolution. Like, oh, no, because I want to print this and have a big print on my living room. And I have a print that I sold that is printed like four feet, four by six feet. And it was shot with a Canon 50D. That's a 2008 camera. Years ago, and it looks gorgeous on on on. It's like in a in a company here in in Lisbon, and it's on their main meeting room. It's the main attraction there, and it looks gorgeous. And it's a very old camera, and I believe that's what like 15 or 12 megapixel camera. I don't know. But you you can print that big and it looks great. So really, and it was not even with any special upsize plugin because in the end, when you have a huge print, you're not seeing it like a feet away. You, <laughs> otherwise, you can't see the whole thing. Oh yes, it's like if you have yeah. a billboard on Times Square, you're seeing it what 
200 feet away. So it, resolution. Oh, yeah. It's the pixels so sometimes are the size of a quarter. They're exactly. like a, like the size of yeah. a, a you know of a coin. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you can see like yeah. huge. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, and that's where I do, I do think that this is. It's an epidemic of just like uh, this misunderstanding, and it, it was caused by the camera manufacturers. Let's yeah, be honest; they, want us they to went keep after upgrading. this mega the uh, upgrading. It was a megapixel race. Um, what I appreciate is I think that uh, some of the camera manufacturers, not all of them, have realized we're over it, and they're starting to just make great sensors at decent resolutions that really just capture great images and not worrying about giving us more file sizes which just causes yeah. us to have bigger memory cards yeah. and more storage and, yeah. and 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 more pain slower operating systems and software because it's bigger files yeah. but you know that's where you get down to it like i had that happen just the other day multiple people and this is i tend to know when something is um you know like oh that's that's i love posting stuff because i can see where people are struggling or where people are having a misunderstanding you know and you know, just a couple of days ago, I posted an image. Uh, it was an image of Elon Musk at a press conference, and it's very, you know, uh, you know, people were contacting me saying, "How'd you get such a a clear shot of him? Like, why? What? What? What resolution were you shooting at? What camera were you using? And all this stuff." And, you know, just asking me, like, hey, I, because they're saying, like, hey, I, my images aren't like that. What are you doing? And the reality was the camera I was using and the lens I was using, the camera was at the time I was taking the shot, 10 years old and the lens was eight years old. I, it wasn't the result. The resolution of the camera was 18.1 megapixels, right? So it wasn't that it's, I'm shooting with a 5d at 50 megapixels and I've got it on this setting and it's some met. Now that's what it comes down to it. The, the, the sharpness of the photo was more about two things. One, the settings in the camera that I was freezing the action I was willing to have my ISO go up a little bit to freeze that action. Then I was willing to use a no denoise software to remove that noise. And then I was willing to, at the end, add sharpening to that photo with a plugin yeah. that made that photo that sharp. It was not, because if you look at the raw photo, the raw photo has got a little bit of noise and it's a little soft. Well, but that's just the nature of photography. You can have the fanciest lens. If you're not adding sharpening, it, I mean, that's a raw photo has no, no sharpening applied and then you're applying it in post. Now Adobe has done a good thing in years ago and started adding default sharpening, right? Cause I think that was screwing up a lot of people's images cause they weren't applying default sharpening. And then everybody was like, I'm not even going to apply any sharpening cause I don't want to, I want to make it you know, straight as out pure as possible, it's straight out of camera. <laughs> And it's like, no, that's we have to sharpen photos. The reason your JPEGs look so good is it's adding a crap ton of sharpening to yep. it as well. Yeah. So, exactly. so yeah, I mean, that's what we just you know, the thing with plugins, they're just they're saving time, they're making you more efficient, and they're getting you back out to shooting more. And, and one one thing more that we can do now with those, well, utility plugins, as you're saying go back into a, our library and get images mm -hmm. that we have like 10 years old, 15 years old that were shot at 1600 ISO that had, we had to put them in black and white. Otherwise they were not usable. Yep. And uh, well, maybe now they are right. So yeah, there's good reason for that. So I think we are way off our time, Eric, uh, <laughs> as always, it's good to have a conversation with you. It's always very interesting to get your take on these things and um, to listen. Yeah, I always learn something when I talk to you. So I hope our readers are also learning something from this conversation. I think we are out of time today, unfortunately. So thank you, Eric, for co-hosting with me today. We'll be back next week with another uh, set of interesting topics and more Team Epic members. And remember, um, this episode was sponsored by Platypod, the world's most compact trap advice. And see you guys next week. Stay safe. Bye, everyone. Bye.